brother Kashan Myers is joining us all the way from Ghana, West Africa. Um, it is pretty late his time, so we are really, really excited and humbled to have him joining us and making the time um, to spend, spend with us today to share a lot about the Kazi Project. Um, the presentation today is on Kazi, the Kwaku Ando Sustainability Institute and Sustainable Community Development in Ghana. The next session later on is going to be renewable energy. It starts around six o'clock. This session is from five until roughly about 545. And then we'll have about 15 minutes for Q&A. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to my brother, Kashan. Um, uh, brother Kashan Myers is the executive director at Habasha Inc. Habasha is an acronym for helping Africa by establishing schools at home and abroad. Habasha Inc. was formed in 2002 under the leadership of uh, the executive director, Kashan Myers. Did y'all hear me? 2002, this work has been going strong. Um, Mr. Myers is a father, husband, international organizer, farmer, teacher who received his uh, Bachelor of Science in Psychology from Florida A&M a master's of education with a special interest in curriculum development from Howard University. He was born in a small rural town in Southeast Georgia called Woodbine. Kashan Myers is taking his life experiences to make a positive impact on the world. In 2003, he led the development of the Habesha Gardens Complex, a one acre facility that serves the Metro Atlanta area through providing education and training in urban agriculture, sustainable energy, technology, green living, all of those magnificent things. And he is currently in Ghana, taking all of this practice and hard, tireless, oftentimes uh, <laughs> um, overlooked work and taking it and applying it to be a bridge in Ghana, West Africa, so that more and more of us can actually make that journey, make those connections and to those that are looking to repatriate, have someone on the ground that we know, love and trust. So without further ado, it is my honor to introduce to you all brother Kashan Myers. Give thanks sister Raina. Um, first and foremost, we give honor to our creator and our ancestors who have made it possible for us to be here. Um, we give thanks to our elders who have also paved the way for us. Um, I want to start off by bigging up Mama Nabantu, who I see on the line. It's a pleasure and an honor to um, have you present, Mama Nabantu. Uh, um, it makes me think of you coming here um, and seeing where we are here at the headquarters and blessing us with your presence. And just give thanks to the organizers of the Black Sustainability Summit. Um, Everybody can give a, a, a silent clap to uh, Sister Raina, especially. Um, I know there's other Sister Raina that work with you, but I definitely want to give a, a, a shout out to you for the work that you've done to make this summit possible for the past five years. And of course, the team um, and the tireless work that you've done for our people. So I give thanks for all of the organizers, everybody who put this together. Um, of course, you know, we were hoping that you all will be here with us in Ghana this year. Um, however, COVID-19 had different plans and everything happens for a divine reason and purpose. So we're able to use technology to still be connected and we pray to see you all um, here in Ghana in 2021. Um, I'm honored to have this opportunity to share. And really, you know, for me, this work that I do, you know, it's surreal in some ways. I just had two brothers come um, here today and we're sharing a little bit about their journey. They just repatriated from Orlando. And I told them sometimes it's surreal for me to know that I'm living out the dreams and the prayers of my ancestors who when they were taken from the shores of, of Africa, West Africa, they prayed that they will return. And so now I'm here returning and doing the work um, that uh, our ancestors have set for me to do. So I want to share a little bit about um, the initiative that we are um, for taking part in right now called the Kweku Ando Sustainability Institute. I'm going to share my screen and then we're going to get started from there. For those who don't know, Habasha um, is an acronym that stands for Helping Africa by Establishing Schools at Home and Abroad. Um, that's the acronym. The word Habasha um, is actually a word that, as well. It is an Amharic word from Ethiopia that means the original people. Um, our organization was started in 2002. Um, we are a Pan-African organization that really has five major components that we focus um, through 
the development and cultivation of youth leadership. Um, and they are cultural education, sustainable agriculture, entrepreneurship, holistic health and technology. And some of the logos that you see on the screen are various programs and activities that we've had. Um, I'll just talk very, very briefly about them so you will know. Um, our uh, Black to Our Roots program is a, a youth leadership and rights of passage program that we started in 2004, taking youth of African descent from um, um, America, uh, specifically Atlanta, Baltimore, New York, um, the Virgin Islands, to Ghana, West Africa, after going through a year to two year training program for them to reconnect with their heritage in a practical experiential way. The Sustainable Seeds program is our program where we use uh, a community or school garden to teach about life skills, to teach our young people um, academics. We tie in the disciplines of math, science, English, health, nutrition, physical activity, all into one using a, the garden as our classroom. Um, the Golden Growers Program is a program that we connect with our elders um, in helping them to really return to what they were doing um, and reconnecting with the land. So um, we go to senior facilities most of the time and work with our elders, giving them a chance to, to return to the land and to till the soil and to cultivate and to share. And we develop with the support of Sister Raina, actually uh, kind of the, the, the sister program <clears throat> of Golden Growers <clears throat> called Golden Seeds, where we connect both the sustainable seeds, young people with the elders um, and have this inter intergenerational <clears throat> connection, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, the Habesha Works program is our urban ag training program and development um, where we teach urban agriculture from an agribusiness perspective, from, from a community building and a holistic health and nation building perspective. There's one that I don't have up here, um, which is, is just a mishap, is our urban green jobs program. Um, that's a training program that focuses on green infrastructure, watershed management, um, and other workforce development opportunities for young adults as well. Um, our two uh, major festivals that we do usually annually, we didn't get a chance to do any this year, is the Harvest Fest and the Organic Fest. Um, some of you may have participated in that who have been in the metro Atlanta area. But all of these programs are really to fulfill our mission as an organization. Um, as Sister Raina said, we've been around since 2002. So we just uh, celebrated our 18th birthday in February. Um, so we're coming on our 19th birthday. We're very proud of that because it's shown that one, we've had people that, that have supported our work and have been impacted our work over the years. And, and also we've been able to now support others in their growth and development. Um, leadership is really a main piece of what our organization is about in creating leaders in our communities. All right, um, aligning our vision. So this is, is this picture in this particular side is special because if you see this is a book that was written by one of the youth who traveled to Ethiopia and Ghana with us in 2014, Summer Robinson. Um, at the time, I didn't know, she didn't tell us, she surprised us when she returned. She was writing a book, she journaled, that was a part of their activity to journal, but she turned her journal into a book called Discovering Summer Abroad, A Teen's Journey to Africa, which is available on Amazon, by the way, please cop the book. Um, and support sister um, <clears throat> Summer. But what she did that really aligned it is that she used the cover of her book out of the thousands of pictures that she took over the 25 days that she traveled to Ethiopia and Ghana. She took a picture of the famous mountain in Ghana called Afajito, which you'll learn about more. She took that and used that as her cover. Um, at the time, she didn't know that that's where we were looking to build our, um, the Institute because we were just in those early phases in 2014. When I saw this book, when she presented this book to me, it, it brought tears to my eyes because it, it affirmed to me that we were doing the right thing because she had, you know, we went to all kinds of places, both in Ethiopia and Ghana, and she chose this particular picture to be what she wanted for her book cover. So that let me know that, you know what, we were doing the right thing and affirm what we were doing. So big up Summer, wherever you are, recent graduate of Agnes Scott College um, and doing big things as a film uh, producer as well as a writer. Um, a little bit about um, the Institute and where it's located. It's a village called Liatewote. Um, just to give a little history of what Liate Wote means, the story of Liate Wote, 
Um, the Atewote is, is the people, the Ewe people of Eastern Ghana, Western Togo. Uh, excuse me. Yes, Eastern Ghana, Western Togo. As we know, there are artificial borders um, throughout Africa. So we know that Ghana and Togo, the people are the same people. Um, but particularly the Airway people um, traveled and migrated through you know, those areas. And as the story goes of the Atiwote, the, the, the elders of this particular um, family, they found this place um, very pleasurable for growing a particular plant called a garden egg. So Woti means um, good for garden egg. So Liati Woti is land that is good for garden egg. Um, for those who may not know what garden egg is, it's very similar to eggplant. Um, it's a more, I guess, wild version of eggplant of what we see the, the domesticated version of eggplant. Um, but Liati Woti is located roughly about three hours um, east of, of Accra. It, it has a beautiful, natural, serene environment um, as you can see, 300 species of butterflies. It also has two of Ghana's most iconic sites, which is um, Afajito, Ghana's tallest mountain, as well as Tagbo Falls, Ghana's second tallest waterfall, which descends about 150 feet um, to the ground. So this is the scene where we um, begin to develop and really where we built a relationship um, for years with this community since 2005. Um, the beautiful thing about the work that we've been doing in Ghana, which started in 2004 when we took our first group of youth through the Black to Our Roots program, is that we wanted to connect with the communities. So in 2005, we were able to help to bring um, electricity to the village um, clinic in Liatewote. And that began our relationship with the community of Liatewote. And from then we've continued to do work in that community and continue to be embraced by that community. Um, so we love that community because it's, it's remained the same over the years. The people practice traditional customs, they live close to nature and they just have genuine love in their heart. And so everyone that I take, um, that we've taken to Ghana over the past 15 years, Liate Wote has always had a special place in their heart. Um, I mentioned Afajato. Um, and so Afajato, the, this Mount Afajato is actually kind of like a double, uh, I don't know what they call it, double atandre, but Afajato actually means mountain. Um, so when you say Mount Afajato, it's like you're saying Mount Mountain, but people call it Mount Afajato, um, but it's the tallest mountain in Ghana and also the tallest, um, many say, in Western Africa. Um, but it's a very beautiful, you can see these are some of the youth that we had um, in, actually from 2014, where we took the youth, we always climbed the mountain um, as a part of our journey. And you can stand there and you literally can see through the horizon um, on this mountain. So it's a breathtaking view, but also it's invigorating the, for the youth to see that they can accomplish this. And it symbolizes the journey that we as a people have to take, um, that we have to keep going because it's, it's, it's not one of those cliff climbing mountains, but it is a continuous journey where you have to have perseverance and fortitude to continue. So we always say this is symb symbolic of African people that we're going to reach the top of the mountain, um, but it's going to take some work and it's going to take collective effort. So this is something that we always um, participate in when we bring groups, both young and uh, um, youth and adults as a part of our program. Um, Tagbo Falls, Ghana's second tallest waterfall is nestled in the same village. Um, and actually from uh, Afajato, you can actually see the falls in the distance. Um, it's a mountain range, so you can see the falls. So this place is what I, what I say is as close to heaven as we'll get. The water is very pure, gushing out of the mountains. Um, for those who dare to swim under it, you can get a, a nice um, massage from the hands of the water beating down on you. Feel this clear um, healing water on your body. It's a beautiful space, a beautiful place. And so this is always a part of what we do to renew and refresh ourselves. And it's always the last stop um, that we have Liate Wote on our journeys with anyone we have. This is always the climax of our journey. So we love this space. We love the people here. And that's why we decided that we wanted to, you know, create something that could be lasting um, in this particular village. And part of it was because of our beloved elder and ancestor, Dr. Anthony Kwaku Ando, 
Um, Dr. Ando, which some of you may know, uh, was a Ghanaian ethnobotanist um, who really was a revolutionary in what he did and how he shared his love for plants. Um, he came from a lineage of, of botanists and herbalists. His father was well known here in Ghana. He was born in Ghana, was well known, and they studied herbs. He actually was also um, helped to develop the botanic gardens as well as the horticultural department at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, which is still there today. Um, what Dr. Andor is probably most famous, um, famously known for is introducing the plant Moringa to um, North America um, back in the 80s um, when he was living in San Francisco, he brought that plant there. And then of course, he later moved to Atlanta where he developed uh, with his wife, uh, Mama Kali, the North Scale Institute to share more about their research. So Dr. Andor is really the inspiration for the Institute and it's um, a lot of what he, do, he, he did inspired us to continue to do our work, particularly focus on indigenous um, species of plants and how they can heal ourselves and how they can be used and how we use them as, as African people. Um, he, was, he was considered an ethnobotanist, which is different than just a, bot a botanist. Ethnobotany is really around how cultures use plants. And so he studied that extensively. Moringa was one of the plants, but there's several plants. He has more unpublished research than he has published research. So um, one thing that we wanna do in collaboration with his widow, um, Mama Kali is to help to publish some of that research and to continue to um, you know, use that to build on this indigenous knowledge base that our ancestors developed for us. All right. I wanna show a little quick video um, to you all and I'm hoping the sound will be fine. This video is an animation of kind of what the, this is the first stage of the Institute. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about it after um, I show the video. But this video really just outlines what we're developing now and what we're in in this phase. Um, you'll hear some music in the background and, and this music means a lot because um, not only is it appropriate for, for what you'll see, but it's also um, the brother who is, is one of the singers in the, in, in the, in the song is actually gonna be um, coming to help us open up the space. So we'll talk a little bit more about that, but I wanna play this video, it's about three or four minutes long. Please tell me if you're having any issues um, hearing it. I'm turning my volume up all the way, but watch this and we'll talk a little more. This one is going on to every African from the motherland. Africans arise and be strong, yeah. Keep hope alive and be the eye in the storm, yeah. Africans arise and be strong, yeah. Keep hope alive and be the eye in the storm, yeah. I beg you, please excuse me if you're not an African child. Stop digging up with African soil. Crimes where them do to we we have it fun file. Them kill off Kadafi we with African oil. Conflict, diamonds, Ebola, syphilis. Missionaries and we don't know what the mission is. Politicians giving four posts to the little kids. Still the possibilities limitless. Africans arise and be strong, yeah. Keep hope alive and be the eye in the storm, yeah. Africans arise. And be strong, yeah. Keep hope alive. And be the eye in the storm, yeah. Huh. Mama Africa, she bear the pain of the world on her shoulders and she never complain. And even through the modernization of birth, she still keep her eyes and traditions to say. The metropolitan city is bright and beautiful, but be mindful, not destroy the landscape. Car, no matter your religion or national division, care how oh, this is your burning flame. Africans arise and be strong, yeah. Keep hope alive. And be the eye in the storm, yeah. Africans arise and be strong, yeah. Keep hope alive and be the eye in the storm, yeah. Hey, God, you see the ghetto every time I pass by. There's little you dying and don't know why. I'm holding on to the piece of the pie. Before I let you take it, man, I light it on fire. Cause I will bleed and will fight you for it. Don't leave or neglect my woman. 
respect me for money. And if you're a soldier, you know it is. Cause I praise my life. Okay, so that, that was just a little animation. Um, big up to Brother Brandon Rogers and Migrating Culture for that animation. And um, just a little rendition of, of, like I said, phase one of the Institute. And, um, you know, this Institute, there are some focuses that we have that we'll talk a little bit about and why we're doing it. You know, one thing that, that I've done through my studies over the years of, of African people and in our culture is that we've been what we call green, you know, we, we see this big green movement and even this term sustainability, we hear about it now, it's been popularized, but our ancestors have been living what we call black and green, you know, for millennia. Um, and many of our indigenous um, practices were seen as primitive, less than, et cetera, et cetera, um, in the past are now coming to be seen as really uh, more futuristic and really the way of the future. And so we felt that it was important that we not only highlight that, but we also now um, make sure that we hold on to that. You know, as this, the saying, the African proverb says, until the lion tells the story of the hunt, you know, the story will always glorify the hunter. So we have to tell our own stories. We have to be the ones to share our information and our knowledge. And that's one of the main reasons that we really, you know, wanted to build the Institute um, because we want to make sure that we, we, we big, we, we um, elevated this knowledge that our ancestors had because it's, it's, it's ancient science. Um, and so we set out to build this institute as a training site um, that focus on three main areas. Um, those three, oh, before I go there, let me go back. Um, before, I, before I go into the areas, I do want to talk a little bit about um, the design and what you will see, because what we're utilizing as we talk about sustainability, there are some aspects that we're using um, in our buildings. Um, you saw some of the, the structures that look like, uh, I guess, uh, geodome structures. Um, that's a technique that we're using called the um, echo domes. Um, anyone who's familiar with paper mache is similar to that concept where literally we have a giant sized balloon that we blow up, um, we reinforce it with rebarb or steel rods, and then we plaster it. Um, once that plaster holds for you know about a week, we deflate the balloon, and now we have this shell structure that um, is very much structurally reinforced, but also um, gives us the cooling and heating effects that we, we need and we utilize. So we're incorporating some of the ancient and modern technologies in addition to using um, echo blocks and earth blocks as well as bamboo that you may have seen. Um, this right here, hopefully you can see my uh, cursor, but this is kind of the above the ground um, look at the site um, for phase one. Um, where my cursor is here, this is our bamboo pavilion. Um, that we're literally utilizing bamboo for both the pillars as well as um, our roofing. Um, and it's actually circling a bamboo patch. Um, and then we have five of our echo domes that we're building um, that have the traditional thatch roof. And behind that, we have our 40 foot um, structures that we're utilizing our echo blocks as well as bamboo um, in them as well. All of these will be serve, serving as um, both residential and um, classroom spaces um, for those who will be coming. 
Um, to the to the bottom right, we have our car park, will be which will be our solar car park, um, where we will have solar panels, and this will be an area for parking, but also for events and activities. Um, I ask people all the time, and I know you. I'm going to just ask you this. I'll wait to the end. I, if anybody gets this, we got. I got a special prize. I'll send you. This design is actually. It's a design that many of you may be familiar with that you've seen probably in every day. You see it every day. But this design is, is a design that I said, as I mentioned earlier, about sustainability being something that our ancestors have always had and always lived by. But some of the things that have been taken from us, right, and kind of repackaged and given to us. So this design where you see this uh, bamboo pavilion, these echo domes, and these 40 foot, they create a symbol. Right, and I want to see. I'm going to ask that question during my question and answer. Let's see who can get that that answer. But it's a symbol, and um, I want to see if you can get what that symbol is. Um, and it, it's a symbol. We'll talk a little bit about that symbol and how you may know it in one way, but actually our ancestors used this symbol before. Um, so below this, you'll see we have farm areas um, underneath. Uh, 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 below um, where our driveway is, we have our rice farm. We have our bamboo what we call our enchanted bamboo forest. Um, we are fortunate enough that where the Institute is being developed, the water that comes from Tagbo Falls actually borders the land. So we literally have fresh spring water on our land. We always have water. Um, and the place is, is surrounded by bamboo as well as surrounded by mountains. So um, this, this really is paradise in heaven on earth. Um, this has been an initiative that we started to develop in 2016, but the community there has really, for the past 10 years, been wanting us to develop something. But we knew that in order to, to do something of substance that we had to take our time and we didn't want to make promises that we weren't able to keep. So it took us some time to develop both the resources, the knowledge base, and just to have everything in place to make it happen. So we're creating this space really um, to be a teaching and learning space for Africans, um, both on the continent and throughout the diaspora. Um, additionally to it being a teaching and learning space around the various um, areas that I'll discuss in a second. It also is a space for those who are interested in returning to Africa and living, particularly Ghana. I'll talk a little bit about that a little later as I talk about some of our other components uh, with the program. But one of the first pillars of Kazi is our sustainable um, infrastructure development. Um, so we'll have housing that really utilizes both our indigenous and um, fuses the modern components, as I mentioned with the echo domes. That's a combination of the circular structures, but we've added some tweaks to it, um, utilizing thatch roofing. Um, the domes itself, they're, they're fully enclosed um, with the structures. We use the thatch roofing for a few things. One, it helps to maintain the coolness of the space so that the sun is not beating down on the circular structure. And it also gives it, you know, that aesthetic look um, that helps to, 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 to garner a certain energy that we know our ancestors um, used by building these structures. And so the thatch also protects the overall structure, you know, from any kind of rain or, or damage that may come um, over time discoloration. So that's why we have the thatch. But we'll be utilizing infrastructure development around the echo domes. We're building bamboo structures and we're also using the echo block structure. So we'll have various building structures on site and all of these will be teachable, right? All of these are part of our teachable piece. Holistic health is another major component that we'll be utilizing um, at Kazi, um, teaching people how to grow and prepare herbs and natural foods. Um, everything we, we will be growing on the land is of course chemical and pesticide free, organic if you want. We say it's higher than organic, uh, what we call it is ITA. Um, and so we say it's, it's even higher than organic because even this whole concept of organic has been kind of uh, hijacked, if you will. We know our ancestors were living organically before this term came about. So we're coming to define our own terms and not using those that others have given to us. Um, but this really will be a space for us to have holistic healing practices around the food we eat, utilizing things like yoga and other techniques for our own physical, mental, and spiritual healing. Um, so it'll be a place where African people can share. This will be a hub for us um, that we wanna create and build. And the idea behind this is really to create a template, right? We don't want this to just be a one-off. 
we want this to be something that we can now create and we can develop throughout the continent specifically, but wherever African people are. Um, so that's another pillar. And of course, agriculture, as I mentioned, is always important. You know, um, our elder, Baba Tariko Duno, um, is, is been um, coined the term, there's no culture without agriculture. And it's something that we utilize um, in our program. So we know that agriculture has always been a part of who we are as African people. Um, so organic agriculture will be another pillar and another component of the teaching that we do at Kazi. And um, we'll be all, uh, incorporating all of the components of agriculture and all of the components of the land into how we do our programming. And of course, this is the food that we will be serving, you know, at the Institute for those who come and participate. So um, using these indigenous methods that our ancestors have taught us on how to grow food on how to make sure that our food is healthy and nutritious and rich. We'll be sharing those and building those and really utilizing the brothers and sisters who are indigenous to these areas to share their knowledge. Um, unfortunately, because of the Monsantos and others, you know, the traditional way of doing, growing food and even living have been shunned. And so you find more people who want to, you know, grow things in a conventional way and spray and do those things. And we now are saying we want to elevate the way that our ancestors have grown food traditionally, how they can't use compost in natural ways, how they've been able to make their own natural pesticides, their own natural fertilizers. So these are the things that we'll be sharing and we'll be building at Kazi. Um, and as I mentioned, like I said, all of this is also a place and a space for African people who are interested in returning and living, um, you know, in Ghana, a place where they can come. We actually um, are developing and will launch next year our repatriation program for those who are interested, which is an 18 month training program um, for Africans from the diaspora who will be interested in that. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later as well. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about some of the, the components of the uh, the institute and what we're doing. This is the bamboo pavilion. Um, this just gives you a diagram and a layout of kind of the various aspects. The pavilion on one side is it's in an octagonal shape. It has um, five sections of the octagon is an open air pavilion, and then the other three sections are a closed workshop space where we've used our echo block. Um, echo blocks to create the walls. Um, and so we are in the process of developing this and you will see some of the up-to-date um, um, shots and pictures from where we are, but we're using bamboo to develop this. And I'm really, um, this, this part has really been exciting for me because, you know, I was able to travel to Ethiopia in 2017, big up brother Charles, sister Raina and Congo Isef. We were able to go through some trainings in Ethiopia on bamboo building and learning about you know how to how to utilize bamboo and learning that bamboo can be just as structurally sound as steel um, and and when treated properly it can last just as long as as any of the other metals that we have and so we see it really even though bamboo itself is uh, a plant is not necessarily a renewable resource um, in in that way that it you know it's the same bamboo is gonna be there over and over. The beautiful thing about bamboo is that it matures in four years. Um, and so it has a very um, quick turnaround cycle. So we see bamboo as one of the miracle plants. And there are three main plants that we'll be studying um, at Kazi. They include bamboo, moringa, and cannabis. Um, and all of those plants we know have multiple purposes to help heal us as a people. You can use all of those for food, fuel and fiber. Um, so we plan on doing more research and incorporating them into everything we do as well. So we're really excited about this particular um, bamboo structure. You know, many times now people travel to, to Bali and Thailand and China to see these magnificent bamboo structures. But we, we have something that we, we know that the world will come to see and we wanna be able to teach our people and to share the knowledge of, of how we can use this plant that has really been given to us um, that can serve so many purposes and can help us to alleviate some of the issues that we're having in our environment. Um, this is one of the groves um, where bamboo is growing on site. Um, so, you know, the bamboo again grows so abundantly all the time, it replenishes itself. We literally, um, 
uh, two years ago, we had a, a bushfire before we got started with everything. We had a bushfire and it burnt down quite a bit of the bamboo. And, you know, at first when I came out and saw it, because I literally came while the, the bushfire was going on and it, one of the farmers, you know, they, we're in farmland. So one of the farmers, you know, was, was, had cut slash and they were burning so they could plant and it, the fire had gotten away from it and it had burned, you know, some of our bamboo patch. And I was a little distraught because, you know, we, we, we love our bamboo forest. Um, but to my pleasant surprise, you know, within three to four months, the majority of the bamboo that had been burnt, the new shoots had been coming. And within six months, those shoots had been almost to full height. Um, they didn't have the thickness that they were. So bamboo reaches usually in the first year is full height. The only thing that it may do is the thickness of the bamboo may grow over time. So bamboo, bamboo just grows so abundantly. And, you know, we're glad to have it surrounded by us and to be able to learn and to use it from so, for so many different reasons. Um, this is one of the indigenous techniques that we use for preserving the bamboo because people say, well, how does the bamboo last? How is it not going to, you know, um, get old, the termites, et cetera, et cetera. Well, um, our brother Livingston from Bamboo Bill, Ghana, has taught us a technique. Um, this technique right here, it, it consists of once you cut the bamboo, you take a steel rod and you poke a hole directly through all of the bamboo nodes. And then you can immerse it in running water. This is the, actually the water from the um, Tagbo Falls from the stream. You immerse it in, in running water for 10 to 14 days. That running water washes all of the starch out of the bamboo. And the starch is really the food that the termites and other insects want that eat, you know, that that's what they eat in order to, um, you know, get food out of it. But once that starch is rinsed out, there's no more food inside. And so this is a, a indigenous technique of how our ancestors used to preserve bamboo. And I'm glad to say that that's what we've been doing, using the same indigenous technique to preserve the bamboo um, so that we can build structures out of it. So I'm, I'm excited and proud of what we've been able to build. Here are some of the bamboo that we've harvested. We've, we've had Brother Charles can, I think Brother Charles was the, were measured our longest bamboo to date that we had. We've had bamboo up to 75 feet that we've used. Um, here I'm standing next to some of our bamboo that is roughly about 30 feet um, long. So we are surrounded by strong bamboo. We are utilizing it and we give thanks that we're in a space that we can utilize this bamboo. Um, here are some of the brothers cutting the bamboo down to size so that we can now use it for various places, whether it's the pillars, whether it's the purlins, um, the lentils or the beams of, of our pavilion. Um, and here you can see the purlins. This is the early stages of our um, bamboo pavilion. And I got a little quick video I'll show you just so you can see a little bit. But look at the intricacy and the beauty of this even before it's fully developed. Um, so this is at an earlier stage where we are with developing the bamboo pavilion. This is what it'll look like from a frontal view. Um, this is one of our most recent pictures. This is not the most recent recent. Uh, we've now actually started to put the roofing tiles and the actual roofing tiles are also made of bamboo using a method called crushing method where we literally um, slice the bamboo into pieces and then we, it, it kind of naturally opens up um, like and flattens out and we literally use it almost like terracotta. If you see um, sometimes houses in places like New Mexico and California where they have the terracotta roofing tiles where we use the bamboo in a very similar way. Um, so again, give thanks to Brother Livingston for um, what he's done to develop this and bring the ingenuity to our bamboo pavilion. Um, we, you know, source as much as we can locally for our building. Um, here we have our soil called latrite. Um, which is a red clay um, that's perfect for making our echo blocks that we build um, our structures out of and we use our walls. So here you can see this is our block making um, site that we have on site where we're making blocks around the clock that we can have for our structure. Um, again, sourcing everything locally. This right here is our block press that was actually developed by students from the Kwame Nkrumah um, University of Science and Technology. 
And so it actually is a, it's a press where it com compacts the, the earth um, mixed in. We, we utilize um, the, the latrite with a very small amount of cement just to give it a, a holding agent and it compresses those blocks and those blocks can last, you know, for, for 50, 60, 70, 100 years if um, treated and taken care of properly. Um, so that's what we're constantly doing right now, actually developing these echo blocks. You can see some of them here, um, how we're developing them and how we, we utilize them, um, you know, uh, as a part of our, our building and development. Here is the, the structure for the echo domes. You can see, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but that's actually the balloon going up, right? Um, it has to, it blows up and then the steel rods are put around it. Um, you can see here some of the steel rods going around crisscrossing um, to reinforce it. And then we plaster, um, I believe Mama Alicia's on the line. I think Mama Alicia and, and some of the African culture school youth um, last year had a chance to do a little plastering and making some earth blocks with us. Um, so this may look familiar to them. It's fun, so it's like making paper mache again. Um, also notice that we're using bamboo on the inside for um, structural reinforcement and scaffolding as well. Um, bamboo is, is used prevalently in Ghana um, for, for scaffolding and reinforcement um, throughout the country. Um, this is what it looks like once we deflated the balloon and once we now the shell is in place, right? And so this is the echo block shell that's once it's in place. Um, here is just a picture of um, the thatch that we get. The thatch is a local grass that's used for the roofing. Um, and this is, it's so beautiful, the story behind sourcing the thatch. Um, there's a, a town that's famous for its thatch um, in the Volta region called Sogokope. And you know the beautiful thing about Ghana is that one thing I love is that many of the, 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 the business, the people who run the business are the women. And so particularly in this particular community where we went, it's the association of, association of women who are the thatch sellers, right? And what they do is people will grow, you know, the thatch, they'll cut it and they kind of have a centralized location. So you go there and you negotiate and you talk with the women about, um, you know, how much that you need and, you know, the whole process. But it's just a beautiful process of, of working with our aunties and our mothers and our grandmothers, and they have even the young people being involved. And so um, this, all of these steps and all of this process is, is, is important for us because, you know, we know that these ancient technologies are being lost in a lot of ways. You know, people now rather go with the zinc roof, you know, aluminum roof. But we're saying, no, let's use these natural ways because guess what, zinc, aluminum, all of those, when we process those things, they're depleting the environment. But we, we can grow grass, it's not gonna deplete the environment. So we wanted to make sure we highlighted the use of this thatch and how our ancestors have used it. And again, back in the day, they told us when we use, you know, the, the latrite or this soil to make these blocks or, or to, to build our, our homes, they told us we were living in mud huts, right? We were primitive for having thatch roofs. But now guess what? You find celebrities now want their earth bag homes or they want their mud block home. Now it's, it's chic, it's trendy to do the things that our ancestors were doing that they once called primitive for us. So we're reclaiming what's ours and we're not being ashamed of, of what we've done in our own ancient African science because it's science nonetheless, right? Um, it may not be in a Petri dish in a lab. No, it's out in nature using what the Most High has given us. So we're proud to say that we, we support our local um, businesses and our local business people in the indigenous techniques that they've been using for millennia. Um, this is how the thatch actually looks once it's complete um, and very beautiful, very strong and gives it just that nice aesthetic look. Um, so this is just, you know, a, a, a labor of love as we continue doing this work and building here at Kazi. Um, this is another, uh, just a shot of where they are now. We're actually tiling and doing the furnishings for our domes. Um, so we're building step-by-step step for the process. I know some people are asking some questions offline. I'm gonna 
just wait till the end and I'll go through the questions at the end. Um, but keep the comments flowing. I'm, I'm trying to just stay focused. I'm looking at the corner of my eye to see. I see there's more things coming in the chat, but I'll definitely make sure we answer everything um, as we move forward. Um, here's another short video, um, just a little more current of what's going on. But again, you can see this is the this is the view. We're at the foothills of, of this mountain range. This is this is the view for Kazi. So I'll play this video real quick. So just a little quick video and I'll close out because I really want to have more time for discussion. I just want to big up our major partners, Migrating Culture, Bamboo Bill, Ghana um, on the ground um, who have been supporting this initiative. And of course, the community of Liate Wote, who's been, you know, um, supporting us and behind us. We are part of the, the family, you know. Um, big up again to, to AKS and the Sankofa Youth Initiative and Mama Alicia and the whole family who have been a major part of, of supporting this work and all of those who have supported Habasha over the years in the work that we've been doing. Um, it definitely has been a team effort and for us to get to this point, um, this has always been the goal when we started Habasha. Our goal was always to help us reconnect and return to, to Mama Africa and return to our roots. And this initiative is our first led initiative. We've helped to support other schools, but this is the first institute that we built. Um, and again, this is just phase one um, of the institute. We're developing more um, where we'll have um, dormitory style housing for those who will be coming in more demonstration and farm spaces as well. But we're excited about what we have to offer. Um, we're launching July 2021, the grand opening of the Kwaku Ando Sustainability Institute, as well as the sixth annual Black Sustainability Summit. So I'm giving you all a personal invitation to come and join us um, for the grand opening of the summit um, and you know, be a part of this. And again, we'll have more initiatives that we'll be doing. Um, we're working on um, creating initiatives where we can bring um, African youth from throughout the world together to learn and to share and also create holistic healing spaces, create hubs where we can share indigenous knowledge around um, building, around uh, growing food, around irrigation, around energy and around our culture. And that's really what we hope to do with Kazi. Again, we're creating this as a template that we can now do wherever African people are, utilizing the local resources that we have around us. Um, this is really special for me because, you know, I, I stand on the shoulders of those who came before me. You know, my 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 grandparents, um, who, as as was mentioned earlier, I grew up in a small town, Woodbine, Georgia. You know, it, it's who would who would have known that I would go from Southeast Georgia to being in, you know, Southeast. Ghana um, building structures and, and incorporating the things um, that, that I've learned. But one thing I can say is that what growing up in a small town taught me and what my grandmother always told me was that the, the, the proverb that always stood, stood to me was that manners will take you farther than money will. And I always tell people that even though my, my grandparents, they couldn't tell you all the countries in Africa, they couldn't tell you in Guzo Saba and this and that, they lived African. And what do I mean by that? They had those African principles that truly make us African. It's not what we, you know, what our clothes look like, et cetera, et cetera, exterior, but having respect, having a sense of dignity, having integrity. These to me are African principles. And I learned those, you know, from the elders who grew me, you know, that, that saying that it takes a village to raise a child. I, I can truly say that I'm a, I was raised by the village. And so this is my way of returning and giving forward, if you will, paying it forward to 
those who raised me. You know, one of my greatest inspirations is, is Mama Aminata, um, Harriet Tubman. You know, she did a lot for us in bringing us from, you know, the South to the North. Well, I see this work as a continuation of that. And now, you know, I say that we, she took us from the plantations of the South and brought us to some sense of freedom in the North. Well, part of what I see our work is to take us from the plantation of America to the freedom, the real freedom of Africa, because I'm a firm believer that until Africa is healed, until Africa and African people take their rightful place in the world, the whole world will always have chaos. You know, as a farmer and a grower, anytime if you have a tree and your fruit are not producing well, you don't go to the leaves to see why they're not producing well, you go to the root, right? And so if we wanna know the cause of the problems that we have now in the world, we have to look no further than Mama Africa, which is the root. And until we cultivate her and until we fertilize her and nurture her and give her what she needs, we as African people and subsequently the world will always be in chaos and we will always, we will always be diseased and have bad fruit. So this is our contribution to uplifting humanity. Um, and I give thanks. So I know I think somebody's coming in. I'm, oh, I'm already at an hour already. I'm sorry. Wow. I took a long time. See, I told you I can talk, Sister Raina, but I'm, I'm at the conclusion. Of, I think that was my last slide. That okay, was my okay. last slide. So you caught me at a good time. So okay, okay. Um, with that being said, again, give thanks. I hope the little bit of information I shared with you all was good. What are some ways to develop rural communities and what elements should be considered in order to ensure sustainability? This comes from our brother Kwame in Ghana in the Ashanti region. Oh, well, Kwame, I don't know if Kwame's on the line, but he probably can share more than me. I'll share from my perspective. Um, I think the, the first, to me, whatever you're doing, the first, the, as far as supporting or developing is to realize that it's a reciprocal relationship, right? There's reciprocity. We, I, I by no means see myself as some kind of missionary or someone coming in. I know all the answers. I'm, I'm, I'm a child in this. I'm learning. Um, I, like I said, we just had uh, uh, Brother Sharif from Brother Kwaku from Orlando that came by the headquarters earlier today. And I was telling them that really I'm a student. And since I've you know, been living in Ghana since 2016, I've been learning a lot, particularly about growing tropical plants. And um, I'm learning so much from the young people. You know, as I mentioned with Bamboo Bill Ghana, it's a brother Livingston, young brother, you know what I mean? In his early thirties, who has this ancient knowledge. Um, our people, particularly in rural areas, whether that's in Africa, whether that's in America, have so much knowledge and particularly the knowledge of the land. We, you know, a lot of times, you know, we, we look at academia as the only knowledge base, but really the longest standing knowledge base is the knowledge base of nature, right? And connecting with nature. And so I think when you're looking to do any kind of initiatives and projects is knowing that it's a reciprocal learning and sharing relationships. Now, do we have things that we can share that maybe can be tweaks to certain things that, you know, are going on? Yes. But are we here or can we say we're coming now to change up because it, they've been doing it the wrong way and now we're coming to do it the right way? We're not coming like European missionaries. And um, I have seen through my you know, 20 years of coming to Ghana and, and, and coming to Africa in general, I've seen people who come, African people who come you know, with kind of a missionary mentality and think that our brothers and sisters, because they don't, they don't live exactly like many may live in America, that these people don't have knowledge, but many times their knowledge base is much further than what we have. You know, we have access to all the technology, but one, many times we are limited and what we actually study and how we study. So to me, development has to be seen as a reciprocal relationship. And by doing that, we humble ourselves so that we can make sure we learn and we share. Getting the input, for in, particularly you know, on, on the continent, getting the input of the elders, getting the input of the, the leaders of the community is very, very important. Very, very important. Don't come in with your own ideas. Find out what the community needs. For instance, in our case, you know, Habesha is an NGO. And, you know, 
in many parts of Africa and the quote unquote developed world, NGOs are seen as these quote unquote charity organizations. I tell people from the get go, Habesha is not a charity organization. Our mission here in Ghana and really throughout the world is to heal from the negative effects of the transatlantic slave trade and colonialism. We're not coming to be missionaries. We're coming to, to heal our people. I need healing, that's why I'm here. And our, our brothers and sisters need healing because guess what? Colonialism and slavery are two sides of the same coin. And they, have, they, they were different ways to, uh, to do the same thing to us, to take our identity away from us. We all need healing. So we're not coming here, you know, unfortunately people see the NGA and they, oh, well, you're coming to pour in money and blah, blah, blah. That's not what we're about. We're coming to build, to learn, and to share. And so making clear what your objectives are, when you come to Ghana, the, the, the elders will always ask you when you come to a new place, what's your mission? That's the first thing they're gonna ask you, what's your mission? Be clear about what your mission is before you even come so that when you come, you can articulate that in a way that the people can feel and embrace that and that they can see you as a part of who they are. So that would be one suggestion that I have of how uh, rural, rural development and rural communities uh, understand the importance of, and then there's, there's another question, I guess, can rural communities understand the importance of contributing resources for improvement and what approaches will be adopted and engaging them in such conversations? Well, I'll say this right here. Rural communities, especially, they know the benefit um, of contributing resources. In Liate Wote, they have community work days. They have community days where they have like one big uh what's the what's the not the microphone but what's the thing that people use at rallies and stuff megaphone. i can't remember what it is. Megaphone. megaphone they got one megaphone in the town and you'll hear about five or six in the morning a call to action for the community today it might be where hey if, if this particular house needed some repair or this needed some something done in the community they're calling all the able-bodied people to come and give support if they need to to build you know um, there was one time when the bridge going over the stream for the falls was broken. Everybody pooled in their resources to do what? Help to build that bridge. So to me, honestly, I think rural communities know the benefit more than, say, urban communities because that's how we've been living as African people. We've been community oriented. Now, unfortunately, with the advent of, you know, Europeans coming and, and, and this Western influence, people moving to the cities or people not valuing that communal living or that communal way as much has made it to where that sense of community in some places is lost. Um, fortunately in Liate Wote, community is very strong and you see it um, among the people. So I would say that honestly, you know, it's not that we have to try to teach people about communal living. It's just sometimes being able to give support and give su suggestions of how, of how you know, things can be done that may be a different perspective. So I think it's all really in perspective and all in approach as well. Thanks. Um, there were some other questions that came in, but because we can because we can answer those, I wanted to know if, if folks that were there wanted to unmute their microphone and ask. Is there anyone in the audience? Yes. Um, thank you so much, brother. This, this is just wonderful. Um, I was, um, oh, well, go to someone else. I have. <laughs> Say that. What happened, sister? I have, I have an interruption. Um, one second. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Okay. She's going to be back. <laughs> Someone is interrupting her in the middle of her question. Is there anyone else that wants to go before our sister Ereti comes back? Oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My, my, was my son. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. Um, I um, I wanted to, uh, well I'm I'm interested in, in coming there in the next two to four years um, um, as soon as my son goes to college or maybe he'll go to college there um, and I was wondering the the 18 month program you have all the information is on the the website on the website no, uh, no oh, we, it's not? We actually, we'll we'll be launching that initiative um, in February. Um, so look, look for more of that um, coming up in February. 
Uh, Mama, okay. Alicia, if okay, you want to call, well, I, I know we got to, if you're on the line, I know we got to call tomorrow, so we'll be looking to talk to you. Mama Alicia is going to be one of our instructors, but, but I'm, I'm talking to okay. her later, so I know we got to call them. But yeah, we, so I'm, I just, I'm just really giving you a heads up, but we, we will be putting out that initiative in February. The program will start in September. Um, I'll give a little bit of information about it. It's a 18 month program. The first six months is what we call our prepatriation. Um, and it's an online um, component. And then the, the 12 months will be actually at COSI. Um, so um, we've been developing, I mentioned the Black to Our Roots program for youth. Um, we actually have developed an online adult program called the Black to Our Roots Adult, in this, uh, adult Intensive that was really the precursor to this repatriation program, which was an online, six month online course um, where adults could go through a training and then actually come to Ghana. Um, so we did that for a few years, and that was really the precursor to this program. But um, stay tuned. Um, we'll be talk talking more about that in February, and we'll start the recruitment for that program. Um, okay. We'll have our, our first cohort um, that will start the program in September of 2021, and will arrive in Ghana March of 2022. Okay. Okay. I'm really um, excited about it, and my background is urban planning and community development. So I, I think um, this is a natural, um, you know, that this, and um, I'm, I'm so excited about that. Now, I, I did have a question about the, I mean, I, I, I like the communal um, dining and, and all of that. Um, I see in America, a lot of uh, African people or people, uh, um, people from Ghana don't eat a lot of vegetables. The, the diet, you know, with a lot of rice, um, doesn't really, they really don't eat that many vegetables. And I've been really, um, and I don't know if my, it's, it's that way in, in Ghana or in Africa itself. Um, and, and I mean, they don't eat that many fresh vegetables, even okay. in a lot of the stews. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that a uh, case? Well, if I was to show you our kitchen downstairs, or if you were to come to the market in Kitasi, um, you, that, that, that myth will be debunked. There's every type of plant that you can think of here, right? You, you, I'm a vegan, you know, Kazi will be a hundred percent plant-based. Um, we, we have already over 30 different type of plants growing there, different type of fruit trees, but yeah, it's, it's, I mean, people's, you know, people's diets I, I are. Know it's, I know it's, so I don't know if that was the colonized African that is not eating. I've I've had to encourage them to eat more vegetables. Maybe the diet that they rice and different things like that. I'm surprised it doesn't have that as you know many vegetables. So maybe they've adapted their diet over here. Um, yeah, this is about to brother Pashan. I'm so proud of what you're doing in relation to the question she just asked. Um, my understanding because I was been there and even in Nigeria, the, the main uh, main meals was plantain and, and rice and sometimes fish and sometimes okra. But I also understand that where you are, you're in a cooler area and, and that the greens can grow a lot easier and, and, and better than some of the lower areas where they don't get enough water um, to, you know, cause my question was that, you know, I'm all into the collard greens. Where's the collard greens? And I think you told me that up north, up where it's cool, up in the mountains, mm -hmm. where uh, a lot of African uh, are born in America who are repatriated are growing greens. But down the, in the lower area was was very warm. It's, it's hard to grow because when you go to the grocery stores, the, the when I went to the grocery stores, the greens were, um, you know, they didn't look very well. I couldn't even buy them. So, uh, but I saw it there where you are. It, it's flourishing. It looks beautiful. Yeah, well, I, I'll, I'll say this right here. You know, people have their own kind of preferences, but as far as what what is here, you know, every everything that you can get anywhere else is here. I mean, it's a tropical place. So, you know, greens grow, kale, collards, everything is here, lettuce. Um, and, and definitely, you know, repassing those from the diaspora, certain things like kale is not something that is traditional here. You see more people eating contumery, which is the leaf from the cocoa yam. Um, but, you know, a lot of people eat fruits, 
You know what I mean? So, when, you know, I, I don't want to get into my Habesha Works lingo, but as we know in Habesha Works, any of the students on the line that, you know, there's no such thing as a vegetable. That's for another conversation. Um, <laughs> but yes, the plants are here. So people eat, you know, maybe in their meals, you know, definitely there are certain staples like banku, fufu, akfele, you know, all plant-based, you know, and the stews have okra and mushrooms and various things. But people eat fruits a lot. You know, they eat mangoes, they eat papaya, they eat, you know, pineapple, they, you know, so people eat plants, right? Um, it may not be where they're cooking, you know, maybe they don't eat as much cooked plants if you if that's kind of which I think that's what the sister was asking about but people eat fruits a lot you know you'll see people selling fruits on the street side they got chopped up fruits you mango season you know mangoes is everywhere pineapple season right now we're in avocado season so avocados are abundant you know um we we just we're out of mango season right now so basically you're seeing you will see seasonal fruits abundant everywhere you know places like northern ghana which are closer to the sahara is definitely you know less variety but where we are um closer to you know the equator um there's an abundance of of plants um that can be eaten and you know depending on the the people um is what they eat now what what i will say is that in the cities in particular the people have adopted western eating habits, right? Um, not only the eating habits, living habits, right? They're sitting in offices, so you'll find things like diabetes and obesity are starting to become here where people now are having to go to the doctor for high blood pressure and et cetera. And that's because they're living more of a sedentary lifestyle. But in the rural areas, the people are so active and so healthy. Like I, I joke around and tell people when I first came, you know, I, 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 um, we it, it was just a running joke that it was like all oh, the brothers must be like at the there must be some Ghana fitness place that we don't know about because all the brothers was like cut up like pow pow you know what I mean and you were like well dang where they going to get up like what what where the LA fitness at it's not that it's because they working they active so they you the brothers will be cut up like they you know lifting dumbbells all day but they not lifting dumbbells they out working they are naturally living and that's how they keep their natural health in their body so people have to, to the sister's point people have adopted western ways and western lifestyles particularly in the cities and so living in the rural areas you'll see people living the natural lives more healthier lives and living longer and having better quality of life yeah, thanks brother kashan i know we we've uh cut up to our time uh we have one more i see one person with the hand raised i saw you i saw you i got you brother I got you. He had it up for a minute. I'm not gonna let it pass. We won't leave without you, uh, brother Chingson. Is it Chingson Lekimit? Okay. All right. Go ahead and unmute your microphone, brother, and ask your question. Yeah. Greetings, everybody. Uh, okay. Okay. As you see, I'm. I mean, Gabon. Gabon is a French country, so is to be like a bit. Uh, maybe difficult to, to understand. I will try, I will try. Uh, first of all, I'm very happy uh, to, to attend this meeting. Very, very happy. I'm a Gabonese, I'm African, born here, raised here. But I used to travel around the world. And um, uh, that project, your project is very big. I call it, um, uh, is a way to get free from, from the slave. Because even we, our African from Africa, those, those who are living in Africa, we are still uh, mentally slave. And that project will help us to get free. Uh, I have um, two questions. First of all, for your organization, your ONG, how do you, uh, why, which, uh, how do you finance your project? The, 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 the project, how do you finance it, first of all. And uh, the second, I'm very interested on um, uh, make a link because here in Gabon, first uh, in Gabon right now, um, we are part of a, a movement. We, we are trying to, to organize, to reorganize ourselves. We are trying to, to cultivate, we have a land. We, we, are, we, we are trying to, to make something like what, what you are just doing right now. And how can we make a link to work together so that uh, we 
here in Gabon, we can, we can follow what you are also doing in, in, in Ghana. So I've been to Ghana, I know Ghana, I know that uh, it's a beautiful place and the mentality is, is um, they, are, they are more, they, they are more, uh, uh, they have uh, something that we here in French country, especially in French country, we don't have the, 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 the way you think so fast and the reaction is so fast too. And here, you know, there is a difference because of the political system is very, 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 very difficult to do most of the things. But we are, we are trying, we are trying to do our best. As we, 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 see, we, see, we see it as a, is a, is our mission as a young African, we have to do it. So we are trying, but we need, we want to make a link because um, uh, um, uh, I was trying to, to get um, to, because I've been to your website, I mean, even on Facebook, I'm trying to ask, uh, send you a, a message, but uh, I didn't, but I think you didn't accept me as a friend, part of your friend maybe, but, I, I really yeah. need to, to, to be, to connect with you and to work because it is very important. We, we don't think that it's going to make a link with people outside Africa that, that to help us to, to, to do what we are doing. So about the bamboo project, I'm very interested. And then I don't know, because in our place, we have bamboo a lot. We have a lot, bamboo a lot, and we can do a lot of things with that. So that's what I wanted to say. Um, okay, first of all, the Bamboo project, how do you finance your, your project? Okay, give thanks. Um, I just put my email in the chat um, for those who wanna get that information. Um, so I'll start off with the finance piece. Um, currently right now, we, we kinda you know, have a, a multi-pronged approach to finance. Um, one of the ways that we finance this work is um, up to really the beginning of this year um, before COVID hit, we were facilitating groups to come to Ghana, um, you know, usually four to five groups per year. Um, and so the revenue that we generate from those, those tours was one of the ways that we finance um, our project. Another um, initiative is in the US, we do trainings and other um, services, fee for services that provided revenue um, for um, our programming. And then we also do fundraising events, festivals, activities. Um, we have products that we sell um, for really for the first 10 years of Habesha, I literally was coming to Ghana, buying clothes, going back, selling those things. That's how we finance a lot of our journeys for the youth. Um, and so we use a multi-prong approach. Um, we don't have any major funders um, in that sense, you know, multinational companies, because we don't want to compromise. This Kazi is for African people exclusively. Um, it's by African people. We're, we're not interested in having Europeans come. We're not, we don't want them around. It's, it's not for them. It, we're healing. We have to be the ones to heal ourselves and we're una, unapologetic about that. So, you know, we don't have any multinational companies. We maybe could have had this built in no time, um, but we, we want to do it ourselves. So um, it's been a labor of love and we give thanks to those who supported us through either purchasing, you know, um, goods from us, um, you know, getting some of the services, traveling with us, um, all of those initiatives. And we literally, you know, I got to big up, you know, our Habesha team because those who, who work with Habesha, all of them in some ways have sacrificed um, their own personal salaries that, you know, some of that money could go to this initiative. Like, you know, we, we all could be getting a lot more in salaries. We all are worth more. Um, but people have willing to sacrifice a little bit so that we can siphon some of that money, as I say, divert and divest that money from, from the West and bring it to Mama Africa. So that's how we've been doing it. Um, what we're doing now here in Ghana, we're actually beginning to build some initiatives um, and enterprises that can support the, the longevity of the project. So. Um, the Institute itself will have trainings um, that we will provide um, at, at rates. It'll be what we call sliding scales for those who have funds to pay can pay those who don't, we wanna be the support. But other initiatives, um, 
One thing that we're looking to develop is a bamboo processing facility. Um, we want to be able to, what I would love to be able to do is to create Liate Wote as a model green village and particularly as the bamboo village of Ghana. Um, and we want to create a bamboo processing facility. One of my goals is to be able to create bamboo fabric, bamboo cloth. If anybody knows about bamboo cloth, it's very, very rich, it's very soft. I want us to utilize the three products that I told you we were going to be working on, Moringa, uh, cannabis, and bamboo, and develop products um, to be able to support the youth and support the works that we're doing. So um, these are all initiatives that we're, we're in the process of developing and creating other enterprises to support this initiative beyond just the building of it. Um, that's one. Um, as far as, uh, you know, um, building those connects that's what we want to do brother like we this this really is about us you know bridging bridging the gap you know what i mean um between the continent and the diaspora and so you know me i was personally inspired by um there's a, a institute in benin that if you're not familiar with and this may be something as a as another francophone country that you may be familiar with um, i was actually before COVID hit was planning on going um, to Benin to the Songhai Center um, and seeing what they're doing. They inspired us to do a lot of the work that we're doing. When I, when I first saw some of their work 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I was in, I was in awe. So they inspired us um, to do what we're doing. And so we, we, it's, it's a reciprocal, right? We've been inspired and now we're inspiring others. And so, you know, there's things all over the continent and places that we're inspired by. So definitely please let's stay connected, see how we can work together. Um, I would love, you know, for you to be able to come to the, the grand opening of Kazi in July, if not before then, but let's see how we can share and learn. And really, you know, the idea is to create this template that now we can take it anywhere into where whatever the indigenous and traditional ways of those places are, we incorporate them. So not every institute or not every space will look exactly how this one looks this one is ghana specific gabon may have some different things that are what are the natural indigenous techniques of how people build in gabon you know what i mean we'll incorporate those in ethiopia where i've done some training we you know we incorporate what our ancestors have been doing in these places we're not reinventing the wheel we want to just be able to add a little touch to to whatever's being done, but really build on the foundation that our ancestors have laid. Because the reality is, our ancestors have been living for thousands of years off of these quote unquote primitive technologies, but they lasted for thousands of years. We see places like America and Europe and all of that. They, it's a few hundred years and they stuff crumble. I'd rather go with the things that has stood the test of time. You, 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 you go to um, Ethiopia and go to Gondor, you see the first castles. When, when the Europeans were still living in caves and stuff, we building castles, but they tell us, oh, African people living in huts. We got castles. Let's not talk about Kemet, right? We have everything that we need right around us. And it's time for us to harness our African ingenuity and particularly the young people. Um, I was fortunate enough earlier this year to go to Rwanda and was really inspired by the movement that's going on in Rwanda right now, particularly with the young people and what they're doing, you know, 25 years after the, the genocide, right? It inspired me so much just to keep going and to see these young people, how vibrant they were, how the society was so clean, how the people are so alive and so involved. So, you know, let's definitely, you know, stay connected, my brother, um, and see how we can work together and support you. And I'm sure you have ideas that you can share that can support what we're doing as well. So definitely stay encouraged and stay connected, please. Could everybody please join me in unmuting your microphones and giving thanks to our brother Kashan and bigging him up for his presentation. <laughs> Big up to all the Habesha family on the line. Big up, I see many of y'all on the line. Much love. Give thanks to everyone. Thanks. Um, and so, and we, we will be in Ghana in 2021 for the sixth annual Black Sustainability Summit and the grand opening of Kazi. It's an honor yes. and pleasure. So yes. We give thanks to you, Brother Kashana. I know I'll be speaking with you soon. Thank you for your time and send our, our love to the family. Thank All right, family. Y'all be safe and we look thanks. forward to seeing y'all soon. All right.
Peace. Peace. Peace.